And now we have a really exciting talk. So we've got John and Nalia from Dovetail Games. So Dovetail are based just over in Chatham. So really local to us. Some of you may even live over that way. And, uh, and they're a fantastic business building video games, which is definitely, some of you put your hands up earlier for being interested in video games. So hopefully this will be interesting for everyone. Um, we've not even met yet, so it's really nice to meet you. Thank you for being here today. I'm going to hand over, I'll let them give a bit more of an intro about their current roles, etc. I've got a clicker for you, and you're welcome to either use this one or handheld. Which are Great. they prefer? Oh, we'll use that one. You'll use that one. Perfect. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you so much. We've got John and Nalia. Big round of applause. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Nyla. I'm the lead development manager over at Dovetail Games. I've actually worked in the games industry now for about five years. But my first job in the industry was after university, and it was a game studio that was linked to my uni, where we worked on an educational game for the BBC uh, that was designed with British Sign Language in mind, so quite different. But it was the first time that I'd really worked within a multidiscipline studio involving filming content, 3D modeling, um, and script writing and post-production. And that's where I got my first experience of how varied and engaging the industry actually is. And following a few years working as a project manager in media and digital agencies, I've come full circle back into the industry with Dovetail Games as lead development manager. So I look after the plans and the timelines across our UE4 products, primarily our Fishing Sim World title, uh, and I lead the team to deliver our content on time across PC and console platforms and help to mentor our other dev managers. John? Hi, my name's... Wait for the third one. Yeah. Hi, my name's John Rissick. Uh, I'm the COO of Dovetail Games. I run Dovetail Games on a daily basis. I think everyone's story is obviously unique. Everyone's story has a measure of good fortune. When I left university, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Actually, I probably did. I wanted to be in a band. I, so I thought, I said to my mum and dad, I'm going to take a year. I've done all this studying. I'm going to take a year out, and uh, I sing in a band, and I want to make it as a musician. Uh, so that's what I did until I realised that I didn't pay the bills and I couldn't make it as a musician. So while I was doing that, I got a job at my local newspaper. Um, in marketing, and I knew absolutely nothing about marketing, I studied a completely different sort of degree from that. Uh, I wanted to be a journalist, but I thought marketing's a way to work for my local newspaper. Um, as it happened, the local newspaper got bought up by a very big magazine group who made uh, magazines like Empire and Q Magazine, if you guys are familiar with those. Um, I know magazines are kind of a bit defunct by now, but you've probably heard of the brands. Uh, and I ended up working uh, as the product manager on those two publications. Um, and it was from there that I got into video games. I'd always been very passionate, uh, a passionate gamer. Uh, I sent off a CV very speculatively to uh, Electronic Arts, and I ended up running the marketing on FIFA uh, football and on The Sims and on their uh, Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter range of games. So I got into video games that way, I got into marketing that way. I joined Dovetail Games in 2012 when we were about 25 to 30 people. We're now uh, 140 people based in the historic dockyard in Chatham. So everyone's journey is obviously unique. Everyone's journey has an element of good fortune. Mine did to be in the right place at the right time to do the things that I wanted to do. But it certainly didn't pan out the way I thought it would although I'm very pleased with how it turned out. So the UK games industry, it's enormous if you weren't already aware of it. Um, it's a $5 billion business, sales generated by the industry over the past year. 51% of, uh, it, it accounts for 51% of the entertainment industry. So it's bigger than movies, uh, it's bigger than music, uh, by a considerable margin. There are 2,400 games companies in the UK. That's a staggering amount of businesses. There are a few very big ones. There are a few more middle-sized ones, a bit like Dovetail Games. And then there are lots and lots and lots of very small uh, startups or very small businesses making apps and mobile device games. These are games that are not particularly expensive to create. Uh, but can be fabulously successful if you make the right one. 
but lots of business, businesses around the UK are in this field. Not too many, actually, in Kent. There tend to be pockets of video game development around the UK, but Kent is becoming more and more a popular area for video game development, and that's something that we're really keen to encourage, obviously. There are 42,000 people currently in, in the industry. It feels like a lot, sounds like a lot. It's actually not that many. It's amazing when you work in this industry, how often you bump into people you know absolutely all the time. 86% um, of people in the UK game industry have a degree. Um, that's becoming more prevalent. When the games industry started in the 1980s and 1990s, it was very common that you'd find people who were running very large multinational businesses uh, who didn't get out of high school um, or didn't get a degree, didn't get A-levels. As the industry has matured, it's tended to become much more an area where you need higher education for, and it's set to grow. 30% uh, targeted growth over the next four years. Uh, it will grow as new technology drives it, as new players come into the gaming market, like Google did. Are any of you familiar with Google Stadia? I've heard of Google Stadia. Google Stadia launched yesterday, I believe, um, which will bring a unique brand of gaming to people because it's based on streaming technology. So technology is really going to be driving additional usage and more people playing games over the coming months and years. Thank you. So over on the development side, uh, we are actually responsible for the creation of the game, and each role within the department plays a massive part in how that game comes together and also how it performs. So there are a wide variety of skill sets required in order to make that happen, uh, which you'll see over the next few slides. So on the art side, we cover multiple disciplines within one team. So you can be a generalist uh, who covers like various aspects of a world environment, or you might create specific assets like a particular boat or a tree or a car. Uh, you can be specialised in creating highly detailed character art or vehicle art, or putting together visually stunning landscapes and locations. And animation in itself is a key part of bringing these elements to life, and they can be technically challenging uh, to get something to just mimic how we would do it in real life, but really rewarding at the same time. And we base much of our content on real-world locations, so attention to detail is really, really important. Skills and courses in the areas that you see here um, can help you to find your niche and really understand where your skills can be utilised to really bring something to life. But actually, a lot of our artists come from um, just honing their skills from a hobby and pen and paper to evolving that digitally over time. So whatever your discipline, uh, you'll need to have a passion in your art and also be technically savvy to ensure that what you put together actually performs optimally and creates uh, an awesome experience for that player, because you give the game the feeling of being immersed in the world, uh, and you need to have good communication as well with the programming team. So our programmers, they make it all work, which I know is simply put, but it's true. Uh, as a programmer, just like an artist, you can be a generalist or specialised in things like gameplay, AI, physics, UI tech, how things look and feel or you can be de uh, developing tools under the hood and performing engine upgrades uh, to make sure we're working with the best tech available to us. And all these vary depending on the game that you might be working on or also the game studio that specializes in something specific. So when you go for roles within programming, you'll likely be tested on not only your basic coding skills, but also on specific scenarios and skill sets. So you might be asked to engineer something from scratch, or you pick up existing code bases and you have to debug or deconstruct it. So if you like doing that sort of thing, then this is going to be really interesting for you. And if you love problem solving, this is where you can apply it to full effect. Some of the most complex issues, from graphical to performance to random crashes that you might find in some other games, um, they're all resolved by programmers working with the rest of the team to identify what's happening and resolve it as quickly and effectively as possible. And even things like audio design actually requires some programming knowledge to ensure that what's being plugged into things like blueprints is correct and triggers when it should. And it probably comes as no surprise that knowing your maths is essential for this role, uh, which is why I'd make a terrible programmer, uh, and I actually leave that to the experts to make that happen. 
So this role here, game and level design, uh, most people think this is the job where you actually get to play the video games all day, and that's partly true, uh, but you do need to be aware that there's more to it than that. And you need to be aware of what else is out there because you want to be inspired by what games you want to create. But our designers are responsible for deciding how the game needs to function and what journey our players need to actually take uh, to get the best experience in gameplay. So they set out the rules and the placement, you know, where do you need to walk, jump, run to, fish from, drive to? How do we make that experience interesting and exciting? And you have to put your yourselves in the, in the shoes of the player and tweak and balance that experience until it feels right. But you also need to be able to effectively communicate your ideas out to other people in the team. You need to be able to put forward your ideas and actually justify those, form the brief that your team needs to work from because they need to know and understand what it is that you want the game to do. This is especially important to communicate out to the producer and the dev manager, which is where I come in. So we need to know what needs to be done so we can ensure that the team deliver on time to the brief and to the best quality. So the producer and the development manager need to work cohesively as a unit. Now, it can sometimes be quite a rocky relationship. You need to be confident at challenging processes and sometimes time estimates to get the most accurate data from your team and put this all together into a plan that works. But both the producer and the dev manager focus on quality and setting that bar really high. We want to make sure the game is feature rich and works with the designers to make sure that the game gives the best experience to our players and our community of players. And a lot of that is based on feedback from the community itself. So it's really listening to what it is that they want. Um, and basically, we need to make sure, especially you need the balance from the dev manager, to find where those features fit within the project timeline, what phases they might need to come in at, and ensure that we can deliver what the producer is passionate about getting out there. And there should be a mix of slight panic and urgency, but also with logically looking at the whole picture to allow this whole big machine of moving parts to continue moving forward and actually evolving. And both roles work closely with brand and marketing to make sure that our plans coordinate with retail dates and announcements or social media content. Um, we need to make sure that we have things ready for them to showcase. And finally, on the development side, we've got quality assurance, or the QA team, as we refer to them. This is really the job that requires you to play video games all day. How many of us here play through games and notice bugs, glitches, character doing something a little bit weird? That's what the QA team actually focus on. And we look to this team to not only play the game, but also to try and break the game and expose any and all flaws um, that they come across. And we need to see that it looks good, that it performs well. We don't have the exposure or the capacity to be able to look across that entire game. We need a team of people to do that for us. You'll need to have an eye for detail, and we'll need to create detailed test plans that you or your team can work from. Um, you need to really kind of comb through the game. And you'll also need to know how to communicate those issues that you found with very clear steps so that people can actually reproduce that issue, that the team know what it is that they're looking for, what they need to fix, and then you can then look at that again and verify it as such. And all these teams within development are the moving parts behind the scenes, and as you can see, not only require specific skill sets, within each discipline, but also share an overall team goal to work together to get the best game out there, which is where I'll hand over now to John to go through the teams that take what we're creating and actually get it out to the community. So, back at the start of the presentation, I was just thinking as Nana was talking, we, I talked about the fact that the industry is blowing up, it's getting really, really, really big. It is a fabulous industry with lots of progression, lots of challenge, lots of excitement, uh, and it's great to be part of the entertainment industry. What this industry doesn't get right at the moment is the level of diversity within it. So if I could leave you with one message today, I guess it would be to be inspired to think about video games as a career. But I would say to each and every girl in the room that this industry is crying out for more female developers, more female producers, more female dev managers, more female coders, particularly coders, and more females to shape the entertainment of tomorrow. And that's all I'll say about development. So I'll come on to talk now about publishing, which is the side, the other side of the coin. So we've made a thing 
and it's either good or it's, it's not so good, but it's a thing that you can play. What do we do with it? Well, the first phase of this is really product marketing, and that's the background that I've had. And I always think that product marketing are the custodian or the guardian of the customer. These are the people who ideally represent what the customer wants and take the thing that development have made, uh, make sure it's the right product for the customer, and then take it to market. So it's about creating campaigns that attract players. It's about creating advertising campaigns and marketing campaigns that speak to the rational head of the player um, and then speak to the heart of the player. So the rational will be, well, it's 10 hours of gameplay and it cost me 39.99. And I can make a rational decision whether I want to buy that or not. Does that feel like that's good value to me? These are very rational decisions that I'm making. When advertising grabs you by the heart, it's much more powerful because it, it re these are the things that, these are the ads you watch on TV, these are the commercials you might see online or the videos you might see online promoting something that really grab you and say, this is something for me. Irrespective of the price and the levels and the graphics and whatever, I buy into the idea that you're selling. I'm excited by that. And in marketing, we have to make sure we do both. Uh, in marketing, we uh, run events. So it might be uh, an event for our players. It might be going to an event. We go to lots of simulation events around the world. We go to lots of business to business events and lots of, lots of business to consumer events. Uh, we run launches, obviously, uh, trying to attract and retain customers through our marketing messages. Um, we have to understand the buying habits of our players. Uh, and buying habits might be, well, don't release a game on a Wednesday at the end of the month, release it on a Friday at the end of the month because people get paid on a Friday at the end of the month, so there's more likelihood people have got money in their pocket. You release it on the Thursday or the Wednesday before the end of the month, no one's got any money. That's the kind of way to think about it, which feels a bit insidious, actually, when you think about it like that. It feels very calculated, but that's the way, as a marketer, you need to think about taking products to market. We obviously think about the competition, making sure that we stay ahead of the curve with what they're doing. And we make sure that we can work with as many partners as we can. At Dovetail Games, we make simulations, and we simulate the real world. So all of the brand partners we work with, we could be working with Southeastern Trains, or we could be working with Daiwa making fishing rods and fishing tackle, we need to, or Columbia on clothing. We need to make sure that all of our partners are legitimate partners, that they're licensed, and that we're working with them effectively. We then have a creative services team. So this is a group of artists and editors and, uh, and video-focused talent who are creating uh, assets for us from going into the software and looking at screenshots and trying to manipulate in-game cameras so that they capture a moment perfectly and then marketing can talk to our customers about it. Or these are people who are making videos. And we'll show you a video at the end of, of uh, one of our latest products that gives you a sense of the sort of work that we do. Uh, email marketing, so we have a large newsletter database that we talk to very regularly as well. And then, which brings us on to community. Um, so we need to make sure that we're making engaging, rich, interesting content for our customers who are accessing us via the regular social media channels or by our Dovetail-owned social media channels. We have something called Dovetail Live, which is the place that you go to register to find out more information and go deeper into the experiences that we give you. We do live streams, uh, so we use Twitch and we use Mixer, which is the Xbox version of Twitch, and we run live broadcast very regularly. So if you're interested in getting yourself in front of a camera uh, and talking about product and being a bit of a presenter, there are opportunities within the video games industry for people like you. Uh, we also do market research where we try to understand who the customer is, both through qualitative and quantitative research, and we get lots of community feedback and marketing, make sure that we're, that is always shared. And with that, I'll run our video. I will click and hopefully it will run.
Thank you. I can assure you it's not always as jerky as that, actually. If you actually played it, it doesn't look anything like that. But that gives you a sense of who we are and what we do. There are a wide range of roles waiting for talented people to take them up in the video game sector. So please consider that as you're making your decisions moving forward. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? I've got a question. How many people could be working on one game at a time? Ooh. Does it depend on the game, I imagine? It does depend on the game, and it also depends on the size of the feature or the update that we're actually doing. So it, it could be anywhere up to 14 working at the same time, or it could be a team of two that are just working out how to get the latest tech going. Okay, amazing. Or it could be on a game like, I also use another example, on a game like Grand Theft Auto, you could have mm. 400 people working on it. It can wow. be anything from one to two people in their bedroom to four to 500 people. Wow, and then that's a lot of coordination to get all those people working together, doing the right thing, coming together, and, and that's why QA is so important, I imagine. Right, we've got questions over here. Passing the mic along. So uh, it's a bit of a plethora of questions, but um, on average, how much do your designers and programmers earn, and do they get the money while they're developing the game, and they don't earn it while it's while nothing's in development, or is it like a specific plan as to how much they earn? Wow, how much do our designers and what was it? Programmers. How much do designers and programmers earn? Um, well, I, mean, I would say it's a wide, it's a range, uh, depending on experience. Um, so from entry level to very senior ranges, uh, gosh, I'm not sure what the exact numbers are, but it, I would say, I, the answer I'll give you is it's a massively wide range, but more importantly, your second part of your question was, do they get paid while the work is going on, or does it all happen at the end? No, it absolutely gets paid while the work is going on. These are people who are earning a, a salary for working on a project for a period of time. They don't get paid at the end, um, so it's, it's just like a normal... Role. But it, the, the salary range, I could give you two figures, but they would be widely different depending on whether it's a, you know, an entry level role or a, or a senior role. Cool. Any other questions? There's one back here. Can you give us some examples of your earlier games? Of your earlier games? Uh, my earlier games, uh, I worked on, uh, crikey, I worked on some great games and some not so great games. So I worked on, I worked on FIFA, I worked on The Sims very early on, I worked on Need for Speed, uh, I worked on Battlefield, uh, if anyone's a Battlefield player, I worked on the bad ones and some of the good ones. Uh, I worked on a game called Mirror's Edge that came out quite a long time ago, I did a lot with that. Uh, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, all sorts of things. One of the great things about the video games industry is it does give you the opportunity to work on a wide range of, of products. The average project, we run ourselves slightly differently. We run two projects that are software as a service. So we're always working on them, we're always refining them. In the more traditional model where you're releasing a, one thing and then you move over to the next thing, you're probably working on a 18 month to two year project in development. So you do get some variety, but you tend to be fixed to something for a couple of years. That helps. Any other questions? No? Oh, at the back. I'm coming. I'm coming, Amy. It's all right. <laughs> What makes a great game, and why? And can you predict what's going to be a good game and what isn't? What makes a great game? Yeah, and why? You can answer that one. I've... What makes a great game? Look, I think it's it's got to be something that is um, engaging. Obviously, I mean, we talk a lot in video games about the first fifteen minutes, um, and I can usually tell within the first 10 to 15 minutes whether something's going to be engaging or not. I look at a product, my, my, my sources are probably slightly older than yours, I do apologise. Who's played World of Warcraft here? Some of you, so, lots not of you. Okay, I always use World of Warcraft as a great example of a great first 15 minutes. It's a game where I can create a character, go into the world, get a bit of story, go on a quest, complete the quest, 
get a reward, set off on another quest. And I do that in the first 15 minutes. And that is the feedback loop that I think any game should aspire to have, is to get me, grab hold of me, and, you know, and really attract my attention that first 15 to 20 minutes. So I would say a great game has at least got to have, has at least got to have that. Paul, well, how did you feel about the first 15 minutes of Untitled Goose Game? First 15 minutes of? Untitled Goose Game. I, this is going to be terrible. Because I've, I've, not, I've not played it. <gasps> you need to, it's amazing. I know, I we'll, do, we'll talk about I that do. Later. You're about the third person to tell me about that. I've, I've never even heard of it. <laughs> 